Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Steam Cracker Optimization, Tips for Improving Efficiency and Reducing Costs. I'm Allison Sterling, a Marketing Manager for Emerson Micromotion, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our first webinar in the Emerson Flow Expert Series. Before we begin today, I wanted to take a moment to acquaint you with your webinar console environment. You'll notice that on your screen, you'll have a presentation window on the left side, a Q&A chat window in the upper right-hand corner, media player controls in the bottom, and then in the middle there's a resource box with links to related content that you can view and download during the event. You can also resize, move, or minimize any of these windows during the event to fit your viewing preferences. And at the bottom of the display, you'll notice a row of icons that gives you some added capabilities where you can choose to share this webinar via any social channels that you'd like. You can also, through the Contact Us button, request a visit from one of our flow experts. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to interact with our speaker by typing any questions that you have using the chat panel, and we will be answering questions both live and at the end of the event. We are also recording today's session, and we will make the link um, to this recording available to you 24 hours post-event via email. We will also be including in that email um, the related resource links that you see in your console. And today on our webinar, we are lucky enough to have joining us Tanya Wyatt, a Global Chemical Industries Marketing Manager for Emerson Micromotion. Tanya holds a bachelor's degree in chemical and petroleum refining engineering from the Colorado School of Mines. She has been with Emerson for 15 years in a variety of roles. She has specialized in gas applications, including ethylene and ethylene production for several years. Prior to joining Emerson, Tanya worked at a chemical company in Texas doing R&D work with polymers. She enjoys traveling both for work and leisure and has visited over 24 countries. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you, Allison. Um, first of all, I just want to say that we have a rather wide range of participants on the call today, so I apologize if some of this background information is kind of a review of what some of you already know, but hang in there and hopefully we'll be able to provide some good value for everyone. So like Allison said, I get to travel a lot for work and I've had the privilege of visiting a lot of chemical companies all around the world. I've noticed that there are some themes that are pretty universal as far as chemical industry challenges. Those are concern over improving efficiency and reducing costs. I think that has been around for a long time and is pretty universal even outside of the chemical industry. And of course, there's always an emphasis on safety and environmental compliance. More recently, I've noticed that there seems to be a growing concern around retaining talent in the workforce as well. We're going to be having a series of these webinars, and we'll talk about a lot of these different areas of concern. Today, the webinar is really going to be focused mainly around that first challenge of efficiency and cost reduction. So during this webinar, we're going to discuss how to optimize the steam to hydrocarbon ratio and we'll talk about some of the benefits of being able to do that. We'll talk about how to improve custody transfer measurement. And during this webinar, I'll share a story about a customer who implemented our flow technology for their steam to hydrocarbon ratio control, and they were able to improve their efficiency by 2%. We'll also talk about a chemical company who used micromotion meters for custody transfer of ethylene, and they were able to prove, after they had the meters in for two years of service, that the meter was less than a tenth of a percent different than the laboratory prover. Then we'll wrap up with some final thoughts. So I think everyone is concerned about production costs and maintaining profitability. While maintaining a safe workplace and ensuring reliable and repeatable data to make better operational decisions. You're probably making a lot of improvements in many of these areas but are looking to do it better. We want to help your bottom line. Emerson can help you maintain a safe workplace and reduce costs associated with safety, health, and environment with our advanced diagnostic capabilities. We can help you meet environmental standards while providing reliable data to help make the right operational decisions. We can also help to minimize unplanned shutdowns through better process insight and control, which leads to lower maintenance costs and increased availability. We can help to improve process efficiency, and through accurate measurement and control, we can help reduce the impact of variability of feeds to improve consistency in production, 
which leads to improved throughput and better quality control. With Emerson as your measurement partner, we can help you increase ethylene yield and throughput, improve plant availability, reduce energy costs, and ensure safety and compliance. We've helped a lot of different petrochemical and refining customers have success in these areas, and we'd love to help you too. And we can do that by combining some of our innovative technologies with many years of field experience. We've been successful doing just that same thing in some of these areas. From the hot section, which includes measuring and optimizing fuel gas consumption. It includes the steam to hydrocarbon ratio and optimizing that. Flow control and optimization through the decoking process. And the measurement of inhibitors. In the quench tower applications, mass balance, especially around the acetylene reactor and distillation columns and custody transfer measurement of raw materials and final products. And finally, process control for some of the downstream products made for ethylene. This graphic is kind of cool because it reminds us of how much ethylene really ends up being a part of our day-to-day -day lives. As you know, ethylene is an important building block for the chemical industry and many final products are derived from ethylene. Some of those products are polyethylene, ethylene glycol, ethylene oxide, vinyl chloride monomer, so that's used to be, make um, PVC, styrene, polystyrene, and a bunch of other products. All of these downstream processes have measurement opportunity improvements, and we have examples of de demonstrated successes in these areas. Unfortunately, we won't have time to cover all of those today. So let's go back and start by talking about the furnace section of the cracker. Here, there are three critical goals. The first is to optimize the steam to hydrocarbon ratio, and that will help you optimize the conversion of the feedstock while minimizing coking of the furnace tubes. The second is to do this while using the minimum amount of fuel gas. And finally, you want to ensure that when it is time for decoking, the process is completed in the most effective manner possible. So moving beyond the furnace section to recovery, the main goal here is to separate the products. Mass balance is important in this area as well as custody transfer of the end products. For the sake of time during this webinar, we will really be discussing two of those applications. We'll talk about optimizing the steam to carbon ratio in the furnace section, and we'll talk about custody transfer of the final products. As you may already know, there are essentially four process streams in the furnace section during normal operation. Those are the three feeds, the first one being fuel gas for combustion that gets mixed with air, the second being the hydrocarbon feed, which is typically naphtha or ethane, and the third is the dilution steam. There's also cracked gas coming out of the furnace. There are two primary variables in the furnace section that are controlled for optimization of the process. These variables are the temperature of the cracked gas, which is typically called the coil outlet temperature, or sometimes shortened to COT, and the composition of the cracked gas. During normal operation of the furnace, the goal is to optimize the yield to produce the highest value of products and to minimize the coking rate. In order to do this, the steam to hydrocarbon ratio must be very carefully controlled. Steam is added to reduce the temperature for the cracking and to help prevent rapid coking. However, if there's too much steam, it lowers the energy efficiency and the productivity. When there's too much steam, it also requires excess quench reagent. It diminishes the amount of hydrocarbon that can be carried through the pipelines, and this leads to higher velocities and more pressure loss. Every hydrocarbon feed has an ideal steam to hydrocarbon ratio that is optimal for that feed, and you can see what that number is in this table here. From talking to a lot of different customers, we found that being off from the optimal ratio by as little as 0 0.01 can cost $300,000 a year in lost yield for every million tons per year capacity. Similarly, 
if you want to reduce the coking rate, the coil outlet temperature has to be carefully controlled. We found that a deviation of just one degree away from the optimal temperature can cost up to $2 million per year per million ton per year capacity. As I mentioned, accurate measurement of the hydrocarbon feed is required to make sure you have the appropriate steam to hydrocarbon ratio and to maintain tight control of the ratio to improve the throughput and the yield of the furnace. So traditionally, a lot of orifice and turbine flow meters have been used to measure these important points. Traditional orifice plates can be difficult to install. They can have multiple potential leak points and they can cause some maintenance issues, especially with the potential for plugged impulse lines. They also have multiple sources of uncertainty, and the measurement may not be as accurate as it could be, or even as you think it is. Turbine meters can be difficult to maintain due to moving parts. Turbine meters often start out quite accurate, but they wear over time and lose their accuracy, and can also cause maintenance issues and downtime. In some cases, people are using Coriolis meters on main feed lines where there's a lot more flow because they know this measurement point has high value. But most of the sublines are typically using orifice and turbine meters. You know, it's easy to consider the acquisition cost of flow meters and think it's too expensive to go with Coriolis or Vortex, but don't forget the full cost of ownership and the impact of coking rates and throughput. Keep in mind, too, that these reactions are all mass-based, so mass measurement can be valuable here. Micromotion meters offer superior performance under real-world conditions. The elite flow meters provide the best measurement for the hydrocarbon feed to help optimize the ratio and improve the conversion while reducing coking. They offer up to a quarter percent mass flow accuracy for gas, which is unmatched, and that accuracy applies over a really wide range of flows. Plus, Micromotion offers advanced diagnostics that can give you more confidence that your meter is working correctly, and you don't even have to interrupt the process to find this out. For safety instrumented systems, Micromotion also offers both certified and proven in use devices that are good for up to SIL3 applications. Our latest transmitter, the model 5700, also has advanced diagnostics that make it easy to capture a great zero, and it provides automatic data logging, give you, giving you more insight into your process. The transmitter was designed around completely improving the user experience, and it has a lot of great features. I don't have time to go into all of those today, but if you do want more details, feel free to use the contact widget on the bottom of your screen and read some additional information about that new product. So we've talked about having the correct steam to hydrocarbon ratio, and we've talked about the hydrocarbon measurement of that part of the ratio. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the steam measurement now. In traditional designs, orifice plates with impulse lines are typically used for this measurement. Unfortunately, the recycled steam can contain a lot of fine coat particles that can coat or plug the impulse piping. It not only results in some unreliable measurement of the steam, but it also requires significant maintenance. Rosemount 8800 vortex meters are ideal for measuring the steam into the furnace. They offer high accuracy, which is important, but even more importantly, they have a unique all-cast design with no crevices or gaskets. This means that the coke fines don't cause any issues with the measurement, and it eliminates the maintenance costs associated with plugged impulse lines. In addition, Rosemount offers a dual vortex version that can be used for this application. The dual vortex can either be used where you have one of the meters being used for process control and the other one used for safety loop, or you can use the dual vortex for redundancy in the safety loop. In situations where you need like two out of three voting for safety, um, a quad vortex is also available that gives three measurements for the system, safety system, plus you would have one additional measurement left over that you could use for basic process control. 
One really nice feature about both of these meters is that you only have a single set of straight runs, so installation costs are reduced as well. Rosemont is the only manufacturer with the non-plugging Vortex design, and it really has proven successful on a lot of these furnace applications. We'll take a look at an example here. Um, this example is of a success at Shell Mordike, which is in the Netherlands. Shell is having some problems with high maintenance costs and a lot of reduced plant availability because of the fines and the steam causing plugging of the impulse lines of their orifice meters. So they were looking for some other type of solution that would help them with their maintenance costs and really be easier for them to use. They installed 20 Rosemount 8800 dual vortex meters on the furnace steam lines and they immediately eliminated the need for cleaning. With Rosemount's unique all-welded body design, with no crevices or process seals, the fines were like no longer an issue at all for them. Even after eight years, they haven't had to remove the sensors for cleaning. Since then, Shell has actually retrofit other furnaces, and the Rosemount Vortex has become the standard, standard um, metering solution for this application. They saw a 2% efficiency improvement and improved plant availability. They also used the dual vortex meter so that one device could be used for process control and the other for the SIS loop, and this saved them significantly on their installation costs. For more information, you can download and read the proven results. It's on your resource list. There's a little window for that, and it's called the dual vortex steam ethylene paper. So if you want to click on that, you can download it and look at it later. So we've talked about steam and hydrocarbon ratios and that part of the cracker, but before we move past the hot section, I did want to mention that fuel gas, decoking air, and inhibitor are also areas where we've seen improvements through using different flow technologies from Emerson. If you're interested in learning more about these applications, you can have a local salesperson discuss them with you, or you can download this article that was published in the Hydrocarbon Processing that discusses best practices for measurement of an ethylene furnace. Again, you can find it in your resource list, and it's listed as Ethylene Hydrocarbon Processing Article. So the other application example for ethylene that we will talk about today is regarding custody transfer points. These may include raw materials or final products. There are several custody transfer points in an ethylene plant. From the raw materials and the fuels coming in to the final products leaving the plant, accurate measurement is important for all of these buying and selling points. There's also some of the internal consumption points that can be custody transfer applications, things like methane or pie gas that might be purchased from another part of the process. There are many final products that get sold to other users, including propylene and ethylene, and ethylene can be found in the gas phase, dense phase, or liquid. Sometimes the butadiene and the hydrogen are also separated and sold as well. Each of these streams represent value, and getting accurate measurements may be worth a lot more than you think. We're going to take a quick break for a second because I would like to get some information from you. I would like to put forth a question of what kinds of technologies are you guys currently using to measure ethylene? That could be in the liquid phase, gas phase, dense phase. But if you don't mind clicking on what technology and go ahead and hit submit, we'll give you a few seconds here to submit some answers.
it looks like we have quite a few responses so far, so we'll go ahead and take a look at the results. Oops, and I went one slide too far, so bear with me a moment. Okay, it looks like a lot of people actually are using Coriolis meters, so that's good news, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the benefits of using Coriolis and also why not all Coriolis meters are made exactly the same, and so some of the benefits of using micromotion meters specifically. A lot of you are also using DP and turbine meters, which really have been kind of the traditional um, historic version of measurement for a lot of these points. So some of the challenges associated with these custody transfer points are really measurement difficulties for the fluids themselves. For example, there are a lot of products within um, an ethylene processing unit that are high vapor pressure liquids, um, cryogenic fluids, or even supercritical fluids. Each of these have their own measurement challenges. High vapor pressure liquids like propane and butane have a tendency to vaporize in the line. And so as you have pressure drop along the line, you get some flashing associated with that, and you have two-phase flow, which makes measurement really difficult. Ethylene can be found in the dense or supercritical phase, and when it is found in that phase, you can experience large, very sudden changes in density with just small changes in pressure and temperature. So that makes it difficult to convert from volume flow to mass flow. Ethylene is almost always bought and sold in mass, so direct mass measurement offers a lot of advantages. Most of these applications have traditionally used orifice metering, but many historic supercritical ethylene measurement points have also used turbine meters along with a density meter. Um, there have been studies by a consortium of customers using a comparison between turbine meters with density meters versus Coriolis meters, and we have those studies available, but basically concluding that the Coriolis meter would be a lot simpler in the application and provide better accuracy. So a lot of these different traditional measurement um, devices will have poor installed accuracy and they could also have higher maintenance and additional uncertainty associated with those density conversions to mass. Um, Micromotion meters measure mass flow directly, which eliminates a lot of these challenges. However, not all Coriolis meters are equivalent on these difficult applications, especially when it comes to two-phase flow capabilities. Micromotion elite meters offer direct mass metering, all these products, like we mentioned, are traded on a mass basis. They offer multivariable measurement. So Micromotion has superior mass flow and density measurement capabilities under real-world conditions. So when your pressures and temperatures aren't the same as your lab environment. Also, the volumetric output can be really useful in ensuring that tanks aren't overfilled, even if the transaction is completed in mass. We provide maintenance-free operation even under heavy flashing and two-phase flow conditions. And finally, smart meter verification is a feature that enables you to check the meter integrity periodically and minimizes your proving requirements without interrupting the process at all. We'll take a look at an example application for a custody transfer of ethylene. There is a pipeline company in the Gulf Coast region in the U.S. that was selling ethylene to a petrochemical company so that they could make polyethylene. They were doing this transaction using traditional DP meters. The DP meters have limited turndown capabilities, and the contract between the supplier and the buyer was written in such a way that if the flow rate dropped below a certain pressure drop, the supply would be shut off because the accuracy of the measurement wouldn't be suitable for custody transfer. So even when the DP meter was working in the optimal DP range, the accuracy of the system was estimated to only be about three-quarters of a percent. 
The line was fairly small. The amount of ethylene transferred in the line was between about 9 and 12 million pounds per year, or 4 to 5.5 million kilograms per year. Both the buyer and the seller also wanted to be able to prove the integrity of the sensor without shutting down the production. After looking at different technology choices, the companies agreed to use a Micromotion Elite meter with smart meter verification so that they could periodically check the health of the meter. In addition, they continuously monitored some of the online health registers through their SCADA system and automatically tied any of those alarms that they would see on the meter to a notification system that would send a text or an email to their technicians. After two years of service and running smart meter verification monthly during that time, they had a plant turnaround and they were able to pull the meter from the line and send it in for proving. They found that the meter had a minus 0.06% difference from the lab prover. And this is phenomenal considering the uncertainty of the meter plus the uncertainty of the lab prover to have something match that closely. So based on those results, they decided to allow smart meter verification to become their standard operating procedure for proving the meter integrity between the plant turnarounds. They also ended up reducing the frequency of the smart meter verification to quarterly instead of monthly based on their excellent results. In addition to that ability to check the meter, um, they were able to get accuracy improvements to plus or minus 0.35% instead of three quarters of a percent, and they reduced maintenance costs. This resulted in a payback of just four months for the entire system, so more than just the meter. They also did an installation of a new pipeline and a whole metering skid. For more information, there's kind of a longer version of this story that was presented at the Texas A&M Instrumentation Symposium available. It's in your resource list as Petrochemical Lost Production White Paper. Or if you're interested in the Cliff Notes version or more bite-sized version, you can click on the Ethylene Proven Results. So to wrap things up, um, with Emerson as your measurement partner, we can really help you increase your ethylene yield and throughput improve plant availability, reduce energy costs, and ensure safety and compliance. We've helped many different petrochemical and refining customers have success in these areas, and we'd love to be able to help you as well. With the combination of our innovative technologies and field experience, we look forward to helping you improve your bottom line. We really would like to have an individual talk with you if you'd be interested in that and get into a little bit more detail. I hope you found this information to be meaningful. Um, before we get into the question and answers, I do have one more quick question for you for our poll. We're planning on doing more of these webinars in the future, and we're interested in which topics might be most beneficial to you. So if you could just click on your opinion, we'll just give a few seconds here for everyone to take a look at that. Okay, it looks like we have quite a few responses, so let's go ahead and take a look here. It looks like there's actually interest in all of the different areas, and the most prominent being the cost-effective options for environmental compliance. So these are definitely some topics to be on the lookout for in the future. We'll try to address some of these as we as we have a chance. So. Um, Thank you again for attending this webinar. We do have some time for questions now. And please remember that if we don't have time to get to your question, you can always use the Contact Me form to request a follow-up visit, or you can send an email to me directly. My email is listed on the screen. So I'll turn it over to Allison now to lead the Q&A session. Thanks so much, Tanya. This is a really great presentation with tons of really great information. So as Tanya mentioned, we're not going to open it up for any questions, so please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A chat panel in your console, and uh, Tanya will be more than happy to answer them. And as she mentioned, if you know we don't get to your question or if you prefer, you're more than welcome to email Tanya directly. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, 
chatting with you about your needs. Um, so, Tanya, it looks like we've got a couple questions coming in right away here. Yeah, so let me go ahead and get started on those. <clears throat> it looks like the first question is around special calibrations. Is there any kind of special calibration required for ethylene? That's a really good question. Um, actually, all of our Coriolis meters, and the Coriolis meters are used for liquids, gases, flurries, um, a bunch of different kinds of fluids. All of them are calibrated in the factory using water, and that calibration is NIST traceable. Um, and because we're measuring mass, that calibration is actually transferable to all other types of fluids, including gases. We actually have papers that help explain that transferability. They are available on our website if you go to www.micromotion.com slash gas. There are white papers that explain how that works. And again, if you want more information on it, feel free to contact me. Um, it looks like there's also a question here around custody transfer. So we talked about ethylene custody transfer, and the question is, what custody transfer approvals do the micromotion meters have? So micromotion has a lot of different approvals around the world. Um, in the U.S., probably the most common custody transfer approval we see is weights and measure approval, and that one applies to liquid applications. But if you're talking about gas applications, it's not really a custody transfer approval, but AGA 11 is kind of the standard used in the USA um, and in other parts of the world as well. But, but AGA report number 11 talks about using meter, Coriolis meters for natural gas applications. And Micromotion definitely meets all the guidelines in AGA 11. So that's probably the standard that's used most often for gas. Um, but again, around the world, there's others like NMI, Measurement Canada. And I should probably also mention, since we're talking about ethylene, that micromotion meters also meet API Chapter 5.6, which is about measurement of liquid hydrocarbons. But it also includes dense phase um, fluids like ethylene. So that one is probably the most relevant to that. Um, here. Also, Measurement Canada, I think I mentioned that, but we do have that for elite meters up to four inch meters on gas applications, so good to note that as well. Um, it looks like somebody here is also asking, we didn't really talk about it a lot, but we mentioned briefly about fuel gas to furnaces. Um, it looks like they're saying that they have some changing composition of fuel gas. I think that's pretty common with refinery fuel gas, if that's what you're using. And so we definitely can help out with reducing some of the impact of that variability by measuring directly the mass associated with that fuel gas as opposed to the volumetric measurement. Um, we end up being able to reduce some of the variability. And we have a lot of information that talks about that. Probably not a good idea to get into it too much here today, but we also have some specific gravity meters that are able to look at the, the specific gravity of the fuel gas and kind of be able to tell you a little bit about their energy content and so we can optimize the combustion control and the efficiency in that way too. So great question. Um, So one of the questions here is around response time of vortex meters, and I don't know the specific answer to response time for the 8800 vortex meter, but that is definitely something that we can look into, and I will reply to the person who asked that question um, directly. All right, well, thanks so much, Tanya. Um, again, if you have any questions that we haven't answered, um, please don't hesitate to directly email Tanya 
at tanya.y at emerson.com, and um, she will be more than happy to follow up with you. If you have any last questions, though, you can pop them in right now to your Q&A window. Um, looks like we just got another one popping in here. Yeah, the question is around any new ethylene plants being built in North America, and there definitely are some plants coming up. Um, we have been involved with kind of specking out some of those plants in the future, um, instrumenting some of them, and I think there's mixed feelings just in general around how many um, of the ethylene plants that were originally planned are going to go forward. I think a lot of people, definitely with the oil prices changing and everything, um, the advantage for ethane feedstocks is not as much as it used to be, but still an advantage. And so most of the ethylene projects that were in place are continuing on, and some of the ones that were kind of planned and not yet permitted um, may be delayed a little bit, but the general feeling in the industry is that they will continue to be building those ethylene plants. So great question. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Tanya, for all this great information. Um, just as a reminder, you know, of everyone, there's that contact us button at the bottom of your console, or of course you can always email Tanya directly. And we thank you all for joining us today and for all these great questions. Again, we will be sending out a link to this recording tomorrow in an email, um, along with links to all the um, resources that you see in your console. Um, on behalf of our guests, Tanya White, as well as everyone here at Emerson Micromotion, we thank you again for joining us today and taking the time to view our presentation. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.